the um, the agenda is that first we're going to have an evaluation update and overview. I'll do that. Then Pablo will give a little talk about ultrasound technique. And we're going to have a lot of case discussions. So we'll get on with the first topic, evaluation and indications for treatment. We all know about the physical examination, the Barlow and the Ortolani, and I'm not really going to go into those today. But if we do have healthcare providers on board who are interested in learning more uh, about that, they can go to our website at hipdysplasia.org. And if you'll, in the search module, just put in DDH module, and there's an excellent uh, validated teaching module that will show you how to do the Barlow and Ortolani exam. It's a really, a really good uh, module that was developed in Australia. And you can recommend that for residents or anybody you're training. So this is an example of a 19-month-old girl, and she has an oral feeding tube due to Pierre Robin syndrome, but she's mentally alert and muscularly normal, and she had a normal hip exam. You can see she's got wide abduction, but fortunately, she had an x-ray of her pelvis, which showed bilateral hip dislocation, so she had a negative Ortolani examination. And the purpose of this is that the physical examination is not always reliable. So obviously you need to follow patients with imaging before, during, and after treatment. In fact, in Mario Marino Ortolani's original book in 1968, when it's translated, he says the jerk sign can be elicited as long as the femoral head can exit even if partially and re-enter the acetabulum. The obstacle to be overcome is small, and the rim is rounded or blunted. And he said, these conditions can always be found in hips with mild alterations, while in serious cases, they are seldom noticeable. So even he noticed that in the newborn, as in the older child with a fixed hip dislocation, but in the newborn, you can have full range of motion and a negative ortolani and a dislocated hip. So the positive ortolani test, how much dislocation do you need to have it? Turgeson looked at infants with the positive Ortolani test, and he evaluated them with the coronal flexion ultrasound, and he found that the average femoral head coverage was 35% at rest, and it increased to 53% with abduction. So abduction caused it to reduce, which is what the jerk test is. But the ones that were completely dislocated and fixed in dislocation didn't have a positive Ortolani test. Now, here's another uh, exam pitfall which the pediatricians will refer to you, which is the child with asymmetrical buttocks creases, as you see here. And it may be a puzzle to you how this could happen in the presence of a normal x-ray. You can see that the hips look, uh, look pretty normal. They're both reduced at least. Well, here's the AP at rest, and you'll notice that both hips at rest sort of float out into abduction. And uh, Neil Green and Paul Griffin called attention to this back in 1982 when they noted hip dysplasia associated with abduction contracture. And that's what these asymmetrical folds are sometimes is a persistent abduction contracture. Here's another example of a child with asymmetrical folds. And if you leave the legs alone, you'll see that the right hip is in an abducted position and the child lays with the right hip abducted. Here's another one abducted at rest but pull them together and you get asymmetrical creases. And normally, normally when the abductors are elastic and flexible, this is the center of rotation right in the center of the femoral head. And so when you adduct the hip, the hip will rotate in the socket. But when the, uh, when the abductors are contracted, then the pivot point shifts out here. And if you bring the legs together, it's going to show a subluxation of the hip or else you won't be able to bring it together, or it'll cause a pelvic obliquity or do something else. So abduction contractors are a potential pathology that can contribute to hip dislocation. Here's an example from uh, actually taken in Pablo's clinic one time with slight abduction. You can see the thigh the, of the thighs, the hip is centered in the socket and Shenton's line's intact. But when you bring them together, you'll see that this looks an abnormal hip and it shows the disruption of Shenton's line. And uh, John Wedge calls this the white knuckle sign. 
this child was being treated for hip dysplasia on that side, but you can see that this side is still a little bit unstable with an abduction contracture and, ab and adducting it causes it to subluxate. So when you see these asymmetrical folds and an abduction contracture, Green and Griffin recommended splint and protect the hips until growth provides stability and then allow natural recovery of the range of motion after the hip stabilizes. So you don't want to squeeze these hips together. It's more important to let them recover and protect them while the hip's developing. Uh, do our panelists have any discussions about the clinical exam? That's really all I plan to say about it. Jim Casser, anything we've missed or ought to say? No, I think with the one thing with the with the abduction contracture, it can lead to contralateral dysplasia by creating a, a pelvic obliquity. It's not real how, common, but you'll see it. How do you treat them? I, it's the same. It's an abduction uh, splint, but just to be aware that the pathology may be on the opposite side of the abduction contracture. Yeah, it always seemed odd to me to treat an abduction contracture with an abduction splint. Right. But it, it well, needs to, they need to be treated until the hip stabilizes. Well, in some later, I did see Paul Griffin do abductor releases on the contralateral side, but I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> no, that sounds a little aggressive. <laughs> well, um, here's a, a, a question about uh, the examination, and I'll, I'll kick this one to, um, to Simon. This is a newborn boy, left hips, ortolani positive at birth, and was put in a pavic harness. In the, in the nursery, do you need an ultrasound when the clinical exam is positive? We're having difficulty hearing you. Okay, I'm, Simon, I'm going to cut you off because it's really hard to hear you. Um, I'm going to ask um, Pablo, do you think it's necessary to get an ultrasound when the clinical exam is positive? Yes, I agree with Simon. I think you, you do need to confirm this, and you also want to have a baseline to work with. So, although it's not necessary to have an ultrasound to start treatment, I think if you have a frankly ortolani positive hip, um, you know you're going to start treatment with this. But I think if you can get the ultrasound, it will give you baseline information, which is prognostic, and I think you do need to have it. Um, I don't think there's any loss in putting the pavlic harness on. If you don't have ultrasound available, it's probably better to start treatment than you know waste time trying to find somewhere where the child can have an ultrasound done. But I think um, you do need to have a baseline to know what your where your what your starting point is. Yeah, and in, in Europe, the graph four, some places they don't even treat them. So. I think a baseline ultrasound can help you give prognostic information to the family. In this case, like we said, his, uh, his left hip was ortolanic positive. If you look, here's the left hip, but in this child, uh, the right hip is also dislocated. This is one that was completely dislocated with an ortolani negative uh, exam by the pediatrician, the pediatric resident, uh, and the attending and everyone else. Someone's, just, someone's making a scratching noise. If we could kind of watch that or mute the mic, that'd be great. Look at that, Simon. We're getting some feedback from somebody, but um, this child was put in a pavic harness from birth and uh, recovered well. Uh, stability is not tested in the harness during treatment. This is at uh, three weeks, and here we are, uh, a little older, and now you can see down in the bottom right, eight months old, and a pretty satisfactory outcome. So even though those hips were severely dislocated at birth, uh, they did respond to pelvic harness treatment. I want to move on to radiographic imaging. Um, and clearly this uh, child's left hip is dysplastic and, and dislocated. And the question is, how bad is it? Um, the acetabular index is often used, and, and it, it's been accused of being unreliable. But it's pretty reliable as long as it's an AP X-ray of the pelvis and the pelvis isn't flexed or extended too much. It's been said, and this is not just one paper, but by several papers, that the upper limit of normal is 30 degrees at one year and 25 degrees at two years. And Richard Bowen has simplified it and said 24 degrees by 24 months. I think we should challenge that, though. Here's what uh, Tonus showed in his uh, 
normative values of the hip joint for the acetabular index. And what you see is that this is the this is the average in the middle line, and then this is one standard deviation and two standard deviations. So if we use 30 degrees at one year, we're outside two standard deviations. Even at um, about seven months, we're at two standard deviations. At two years, uh, 25 degrees is two standard deviations. So 24 degrees, 24 months is two standard deviations from the norm, and 30 degrees at one year is two standard deviations from the norm. Now, I, I would point out that two standard deviations from the norm for IQ is an IQ of less than 70. And most of us wouldn't want our children to have that if they could avoid it. Two standard deviation for height is an adult male with a height of five feet, four inches. And basically two standard deviations is in the third percentile. That means 97% of people are gonna have a better uh, acetabular index if you use the 30 at one year and 24 at two years. So it may be a little too rigid. Do you want to say something about that, Pablo? You had a comment about a paper that's coming up. Can't hear you. Yes, I do. I think one of the um, questions we need to look at with this, and there's some very interesting data coming out of a paper which is soon to be published out of the group in Denver looking at this as percentile, because I think we've been looking at this the wrong way. And if you look at it like this, you talk about less than two standard deviations, this is obviously way outside of the norm. And I think this is highlighted by the fact that we see this uh, later on, because we treat these and they remain dysplastic. And then we have this huge number of adolescents and adults who go on to have dysplastic hips. And they're only slightly dysplastic, but they're dysplastic. So I think that this new data coming out of the group in Denver is going to be very interesting, looking at this as a, as a percentile more than um, just a standard deviation. Yeah. So at least for now, uh, we have to note that two standard deviations at one year is 29 degrees and two standard deviations at two years is 25 degrees. So that those upper limits are probably uh, going to come down. Um, I want to talk about ultrasonography, and then I'm going to turn over to, um, to Pablo for a while. And the first are methods of interpretation, which is principally the graph and the Harkey method. And the graph method is, this could be a review for some of you, but uh, maybe not for others. The graph method is a static measurement, and a bigger alpha angle is better. And the alpha angle being shown here is if you were looking at uh, an AP image of the hip, if you could imagine, you're looking at AP image of the hip, and this is the acetabular roof. And so you're looking at the acetabular roof would be the alpha angle. Now, um, what happens is that because of the way the film is turned, we're actually looking at it sideways. If you could imagine making a, a video of your friends or yourself or your children, if you turn the camera sideways, then it's going to show up sideways on the screen. And that's what happens here is the coronal view we're basically turning the the um, turning the wand sideways so that you're looking at it like this, but essentially it's an AP view of the hip with the alpha angle being the um, the bony pelvis. So here's here's an example of an alpha angle and bigger is better. And graph basically identified that at six weeks of age in the class one which is normal, the alpha angle is greater than 60 degrees. The class two with mild deficiency, it's 43 to 60, and, and class three is less than 43. So if you're using the, the graph method, what you need to remember is 60 degrees and 43 degrees. And then there's an unmeasurable class, which is uh, completely dislocated, but 60 and 43 are, um, if it's less than 43, it's pretty severe. And if it's greater than 60, then he considers it normal. But when you look at normal, again, if we look at the mean, this is a study from uh, Peter Cundy in Australia. At birth, the median alpha angle is 70, and by six weeks, it's 76. So 60 degrees at 76 is fairly far off from the mean, and by three months, the alpha angle increases to 80 degrees. So um, when we use 60 degrees at six months, that's getting pretty dysplastic. 
So here's treatment based on graph. If it's 50 to 60 degrees in less than three months, in other words, it's, if in that range less than six months, then some would observe it. But by uh, after three months, then most people would treat it if it's less than 60 degrees. And then the ones that are uh, 43 to 59 degrees are going to be treated um, in this age group. So here's here's some ranges of the alpha angles. Um, you look a straight line down the pelvis, and then the alpha angle here. Uh, actually, these are percentages. Sorry, these are percentages of. Um, well, these are the alpha angles. Um, this is an alpha angle of 70. So this would be a normal hip, and it's well contained. An alpha angle of 51 degrees would be dysplastic, and 38 is dislocated, and the lines even draw in the wrong place for coverage. So you can see this is blunted as well. I think you're going to go into that in a little more detail, right, Pablo, or not? Yes, I am. The Harkey method is dynamic, and it reproduces the Barlow test. So there's pressure put on the hip down here as the, as the procedure is being done. Again, this can be done in the coronal view, and this is a 50% coverage. He measures the coverage line through the center of the femoral head. And it's 40% with pressure, so it moves a little bit with pressure. So it's reported as percentage coverage with and without pressure is the Harkey method. The normal is better than 50% coverage. Moderate subluxation is 35 to 50. Severe 10 to 35, and dislocated is less than 10%. Um, so here's some examples of coverage. Again, this was 65% covered. Here's the line and the percent coverage is 65 percent so that's normal 35 percent would be subluxation and dislocated is zero even though the radiologist drew it in the wrong place the transverse view is a really good way to do a dynamic ultrasound but it's confusing if you've not looked at them very often and think of the transverse view here's the wand again and basically the leg is in the air and you're looking at the posterior wall of the acetabulum here. So the femoral head's here, and this is the posterior wall of the acetabulum and the triradic cartilage. And it looks like this. Here's See, here's the greater trochanter. Here's the greater trochanter, the femoral head, and this is the posterior wall of the acetabulum and the triradic cartilage. So that would be normal. This is the uh, pivotal plate. And this is outlined here. Well, what happens again is you're, you're looking at it sideways because of the way the scan is done. So you're basically looking at them in this direction. And so here's the femoral head. This is the posterior. This is the labrum here. And when you push on it, it can displace. So treatment of DDH based on the Harkey method. Um, newborns may have four to six millimeters of instability that resolves. The advantage of this is measurements not required. It's a rapid exam. It's easily performed in the harness although you don't stress it during treatment except at the end of treatment. Uh, indications this way, if at birth, if the hip's dislocated, you would treat them. At three weeks, if subluxation's present on the uh, stress, and at six weeks, if any instability is present, and then you would continue treatment until it's stable and mild stress is okay at the end of treatment. Um, if anyone wants to comment now, we can, or why don't we let turn it over to Pablo and let him uh, carry on. This is an entire patient encounter showing how to set up the necessary equipment for performing ultrasound. The baby is kept comfortable by only uncovering the necessary part and lying on their own blanket. The room should be kept warm, dark, and quiet. We begin by taking history while simultaneously performing a clinical exam. I will always examine both hips and start with the right hip. The transducer is held in the left hand and placed parallel to the axis of the femur to obtain a so-called transverse view of the right hip. This allows evaluation of the dynamic component of the hip. Then, by turning the transducer 90 degrees, the coronal view can be obtained, which is useful for morphologic assessment. 
The left hip is evaluated by holding the transducer in the right hand, and the same routine is followed. By placing the transducer parallel to the main axis of the femur, a transverse view is obtained, and the dynamic component of the exam is performed. By turning the transducer 90 degrees, a coronal view will allow for morphologic examination. It has been shown that ultrasound has a sensitivity close to 100% for the detection of stable dysplasia. And the addition of the dynamic component provides a sensitivity of 89% for detecting instability. As seen on this video, where this femoral head is seen to be well seated, stable within the socket, whereas this other femoral head is seen to displace posteriorly under stress. Ultrasound is a supplement to physical exam and a useful tool for screening and diagnosis. Again, the transducer is placed in the left hand to evaluate the right hip. By placing it parallel to the major axis of the femur, adducting and pressing slightly, the hip can be determined to be stable or unstable. Then, turning the transducer 90 degrees and using a coronal view, the morphology of the hip can be determined, and the hip can be deemed to be dysplastic or not. The left hip is evaluated in the same way, only holding the transducer in the right hand. In order to better understand the transverse view, the sequence will show a representation of the image that is obtained. It is easiest to think of the child as lying on its side, with the buttocks toward the right of the screen and the transducer on top. The important structures of the hip can be seen depending on the depth of the ultrasound. With this assessment, hips can be classified based on their stability and morphology. This is a simplified version of the original classification described by Professor Graf, which is somewhat complicated to be used in the setting of a busy clinical practice. An easier way to think about the pathology is to consider only three degrees of severity, dysplasia, instability, and dislocation. But in the clinical setting, in reality, the only decision that needs to be made is whether a hip is normal or abnormal. Having established that ultrasound is useful for screening and diagnosis, I will show that it is also useful for evaluating treatment. When a patient is in a pelvic harness or similar orthosis, the ultrasound can be performed just as easily. The child remains supine on the examining table, and the harness does not need to be removed. The location and degree of instability of the femoral head can be determined. The measurement of angles is considered optional by many clinicians. However, to construct these angles, a baseline should be drawn parallel to the lateral border of the eye. By determining what proportion of the femoral head is below this baseline, a percentage of coverage can be calculated. A second line drawn along the bony root from the triradiate cartilage to this baseline will form the so-called alpha angle, which should measure at least 60 degrees and decreasing values represent greater degrees of displacement. A third line, drawn from the intersection of the first two to the edge of the cartilaginous coverage of the hip, forms the so-called beta angle, which should measure at most 55 degrees, and an increasing value represents greater subluxation of the femoral head. So, ultrasound will provide guidelines for when to start treatment which for me should be in any hip which is considered abnormal, whether it is stable dysplasia, instability, or dislocation, regardless of being reducible or not. It will also provide guidelines for when to stop treatment, that is, when a hip is found to be irreducible after about two or three weeks in treatment. 
or if a serious complication arises. Otherwise, it is my protocol to continue treatment until the hip is found to be completely normal, both on the physical exam as well as ultrasound examination. In conclusion, as seen in this video, ultrasound is a test which takes approximately 8 seconds to determine stability and morphology of the infant hip, making it the most useful imaging exam for this age group. By improving our ability to detect hip dysplasia, we will also improve our outcomes both in the short and the long term. Thank you very much. Okay. Here's the first case. This is a three-month-old uh, boy, family history. Pediatrician felt the hip click, and the exam's, uh, the exam's normal. There was a positive family history, and this is the imaging, the static imaging of alpha angles, percentage coverage, and the transverse left hip. So, um, Scott, what would you do with this one? It's a three-month-old boy. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Tree. Pavicarnas. Pavicarnas. Okay, that's all you can say. Diamond. You treat it. Uh, Pablo? Yes, so I think this comes back to what I was just talking about. For me, um, there's only two types of hips which you need to make a decision on, whether this is normal or abnormal. And whether you make measurements or not, this hip is, for me, it's not within the range of being normal. So this would be treated. But if it were newborn, you'd consider it normal, would you? Well, even if it was a newborn, if it was an abnormal exam, I don't think there's any downside to starting a pavlic harness. Because wow. I've never seen any of the reported complications from a pavlic harness in a, in a located hip. So even if it was a newborn, I would, I would treat this. How about you, Jose? Months, definitely. Uh, so for me, yeah, um, the alpha angles look more or less okay. I would probably examine them. If the exam feels normal, maybe at three months, it's still already uh, too much, or probably I'll put them on a, a push and push. Jim, you want to finish it up? Any comments about this, if this were a newborn compared to three-month-old? Yeah, I do think the age is important because this, if you had stable dysplasia in a child, uh, four to six weeks of age, uh, then I would initiate treatment. But in a newborn, this would be a common finding, I think. Yeah. And I would not treat it. Okay. So, but it's three months, which is in the, the normal um, alpha angle of three months should be in the range of 70 or 76 degrees. So, right. At this age, absolutely would treat it. So the child was treated with a pavic harness, and here's 13 months with... Um, with, um, you know, it looks pretty good. The index is 20 and 21. And actually, if you look at the uh, normal values in the tonus classification, this is this is dead center. So at this age, you could certainly treat the child and expect a good result. But I wouldn't have waited either, and we didn't. So here's another one. Um, this is a six-week-old girl. Uh, you can see the alpha angles. 51 degrees, 46% uh, coverage with pressure. So this child's a little younger. Um, normal bilateral hip exam is newborn. This was just seen because of breach during gestation. Mother had DDH, but it was elective C-section. Scott, what about this one? Six weeks. Hold that on, tablet. Okay, we got you. <laughs> And uh, let's go around real quickly. Simon, Pavlik? Yes, I would treat Is anybody that wouldn't treat this with a Pavlik? Speak up. Would anyone treat it with something different? Jim? Abduction brace for me. Pavlik, what? What, Jose? Abduction brace for me, not Pavlik. If the hips are reduced and look reduced, I usually take it a little bit easier on the family and the patient, and they do well anyway. Uh-huh. We comment about that, Jim. You present. You all published a paper about the failed pavic using abduction bracing. I think either either brace is fine. 
I, in general, I found the tablet harness to be easy to use, low complication rate, and that's the standard. Uh, for me. In those that fail, then I would might use induction brace, but I would treat this at six weeks. Okay. Well, um, this one. Um, I'm stuck. Let's see. Okay. That's the right hip transverse view. And I think you can see this is at six weeks. It, it moves a little bit, but not much. And this is the left hip um, transverse view. So anyway, if you look at, at this, um, there are some studies that talk about the normal exam with an abnormal ultrasound like this at six weeks. And this group had, um, you know, 192 hips less than one month old. 43 were treated with the pavic harness and 149 were not treated. And what they found was that uh, they had equal severity of ultrasound findings and the treated patients had no late dysplasia and the untreated had, had mild dysplasia not requiring treatment. So they said you don't have to treat all these. And Turgeson said the same thing, 306 infants with moderate ultrasound subluxation, no treatment, 91% became normal by four to five months. And uh, the remaining 9% were successfully treated with three to six months of abduction bracing. So they were kind of advocating not treatment, and yet all of you are pretty aggressive with this. So this child, um, this child was actually observed uh, with this at, at six weeks. And uh, here's at nine weeks, the alpha angle is 67 degrees, and um, there's 43% coverage without pressure. This is without treatment. And um, the right hip looks pretty good. There's maybe a little bit of instability here. This is the a little bit of movement there. Left hip, 67 degrees. Pretty good coverage. It was still observed at nine weeks. And here we are at an older age, at three months now. So is that okay? <laughs> Scott, no. Pablo, no. It's not okay. It was observed. No, um, and I think that comes back to it again. Just if I could quickly jump in. You showed those transverse views and said with stress. But we don't know how much stress was being placed on that. And that's yeah. why you really need to be in the room when the ultrasound is being done. You might not have to be the orthopedic surgeon, but you have to know your radiologist or your radiology, radiology tech and know just how hard they can push down. Because you can see some radiologists do some stress testing, and they won't even push on those hips. And if you press a little bit more, you can find some instability. So I think this one is clearly was clearly dysplastic and clearly had some instability. At nine weeks, there shouldn't be almost any movement between the femoral head and the acetabulum. And that one clearly shows some. I don't know how much is being pressed down on it. So uh -huh. I think it comes back to what we were talking about. There's discrepancy. How come we see one in 30 adults with hip dysplasia if we're only treating one in a 1,000? Yep. Simon, what do you have any comments about this at three months? What are you going to do now? I'm having trouble hearing you. Maybe other people can hear you. Can everybody hear me? No. Uh, not well. Hey, Chad? Yeah. Chad, in the Turgeson paper, what you stated was that 10% uh, of that group had the persistent dysplasia. And I think this case brings up the reason why most of us are aggressive in treatment. You could still initiate an abduction bracing program, as Turgeson suggested, but uh, I, th I think most of us would take the opportunity to treat a bit earlier. Yeah, I agree. Good point. So here's the problem. Well, back yeah. to you, Jim. If I could jump back in quickly, why wouldn't you have treated that? Um, the last case we saw, even if it was a newborn, the earlier you treat this, the faster you're going to have them out of the harness. So, I think it's just a it's a question about how many are going to get better, and in the new and how many you'll treat. That right. in the newborn period, you end up uh, finding that relatively frequently. And in every case, looking at ultrasound screening, you see a high, uh, very high incidence of treatment. 
of a, of a stable dysplastic hip. Uh, the longer you wait, the fewer you're going to treat. Six months is my time when I'd start treatment. Sure. We're, not, we're of course, six I don't weeks. Think, I don't think in this country anyone's doing ultrasounds on newborns with the normal exam. Uh, and this uh, this child had a normal exam at birth. Now, so when you find it at four to six weeks, then it's a different story. But we do we do ultrasounds on the abnormal exams to see where we're starting. But uh, we're not doing ultrasounds on normal newborns by exam. So, but anyway, this ch this child um, went on. Now here here's the child at three years old, and you can say, okay, this is less than thirty degrees, but you all have made my case, and that uh, this child really would have benefited from treatment because when you look again at the s tabular index, here's at three years, this is beyond two standard deviations from the mean. So who knows what this will do in the future? And uh, this was a six week old child with a 51 degree index and at nine nine weeks still had some instability. So I agree with you. I think most of us are getting more, more aggressive with these because we want the kids in this range at maturity. And some people might look at this and say, well, gee, that those hips look pretty good, but you know, they're not. Um, so anyway, when you go back to these studies that said about the uh, abnormal ultrasound, they become normal. Well, the way they measured the normal was an acetabular index within two standard deviations. So I think their normal was not what we would accept as normal. And this is the same way. They had defined normal as an acetabular index within two standard deviations. Um, let me turn it back over to you now, Pablo. So we'll go on to another case, and this one is a six-day-old girl who is referred for hip clicks with bilateral ortolani positive um, hips. The pavlik's already been started somewhere else. So she comes to you with a bilateral uh, positive ortolani sign with a pavlik harness. And this is the first image you have. So, Jose, what do you think about this? So at two weeks is still, uh, if clinically the hips are still filled that they go in, I will continue with the harness monitor, make sure that I'm not over flexing the hips, not over abducting them. But still two, three weeks, uh, I will say up to four weeks in the harness. If it doesn't go in, then I'll switch my plan. But it looks like it may be some, uh, let me be a chance. So I think that's a very good question, which we still don't have the answer to. Simon, I know we're having a hard time hearing you, but what's your feel? How long should you go in a, in a, in a pavlic harness? I think the hip on the left of the screen, which is the right hip, looks to be fairly located. This plastic is located. But the one on the right of the screen is the left hip, and you can see that one's still fairly far away. So how long, Simon, do you think we should keep on going um, with the harness? Typically, my maximum back in four weeks in the harness chat. This all throws back to you now. The right hip, which is on the left of the screen, is seen to be improving. Um, the acetabular edge still looks very blunted. It's not a normal looking hip, but that hip was found to be stable. But the hip on the left is still far away. You can see it um, there. It's still far away. Well, at this point, I think you've got a couple of choices. Uh, if, it, if it's reducible and ortolani positive, as Jim Castor has shown, you can take the child out and put him in an ill-felt splint or a, a fixed abduction orthosis and recover some of these. Um, I think you can keep the child in a pavic harness on one side and leave the other leg free. There is a way to do that. The uh, other alternative, which was just uh, presented by Kamigaya from Japan, was to give them a four-week rest period and try the pavic harness again. And he had a 50% success rate on the second attempt. So uh, I would probably leave one leg out 
if, if it's ortolani positive, I'd put them in an abduction brace. If it's not, then I would uh, leave one leg out for a month and try again. Jim, what's your um, feeling on a failed pavlocarnus? Once you take this out of the pavlocarnus, it's four weeks old. Yeah, I think usually three weeks would be when I would stop. Uh, and when we've used the abduction splint, it's always with a reducible hip. And if this hip doesn't uh, go into the acetabulum at all and has a tight adductor, then I don't think the uh, abduction splint is going to work satisfactorily. Okay, so we actually adjusted this and moved the harness a little bit, but we decided to keep him in, keep her in the harness. And at six weeks, um, this is the image you get. So Scott, I mean, you're having a hard time talking as well, but we get your opinion on this. What about your opinion for a failed pavlic harness? Well, you, you, uh, you're moving ahead. Okay, so keep it going. Keep it going. Looks like you're in. Okay, so I think so too, and I think this hip um, eventually went in and it, it became stable. And just by keeping it, I think a lot of this comes down to issues with the harness tablet, with just modifying it, involving the parents, making sure they know how to use it. Because sometimes we will abandon a pavlic harness and blame it on the harness treatment, and maybe it might have been a poorly indicated treatment. All too often, I see the patients coming in with that pavlic harness, which was prescribed to them and placed by orthotics. This is something which you have to do, and which you have to involve the parents, and you have to spend a fair amount of time teaching them how to use it. So I think with this girl, what really happened it took us about three weeks just to get the parents to understand how they needed to use it. So I don't think there's a clear answer to this and how long we should go in a harness. But I think in some in some hips we can go a little bit more than the three or four weeks, which is traditionally what we've been using. This one we kept him for six weeks, and at a year of age, it's still not perfect looking hips, especially on the left. It still looks a little bit dysplastic, and if you measure this out, um, the angles are above what we would consider normal 25 on the right and 26 on the left. But I think most of us would not have. Uh... Continued. What's that say? I can't see ab abduction hip abduction brace at this point. I'm going to take it back, Pablo, and show one more case. Um, so this is a this is the last case, and it's indications for treatment again. This is a seven month old girl. Um, what would you do with this one? Uh, what would you do with this one, Pablo? Or let me let me ask Jose. What would you do with this one, Jose? Um, <laughs> okay, we, we'll see how Scott feels about it. Does this patient, uh, obviously, uh, the not going to help much. Uh, you are not going to get an ortolani more than likely. Uh, I will probably, at this stage, take the patient to uh, a front view just to make sure it, looks, uh, it may be reducible and probably take it to the OR and do arteries to see where we are, give reduces. Because it's not too high, probably it'll be okay to do a close reductions. I know some people will elect to hold off until one year, 30 months of age or so, where the ossific nucleus is completely present to then reduce the hips. Jim, would you, uh, we saw a pavlic harness from Scott. What would you do, Jim? I think that if uh, this child's not uh, developmentally, if they're still uh, not trying to stand up or not trying to move at all, uh, you'd, and there's not uh, tight contractures, it's possible to treat this with an abduction brace. Without an ossified femoral head, ultrasound might give you some good information. But if there's tight adductors, I would go along with uh, Jose and do arthrogram and take him to the OR. But you might be able to treat it with a splint. Take him to the OR, put him in a cast, you mean? Yeah, if if the child had tight adductors and had uh, uh, was moving around such that uh, uh, a, a brace or pavlic would not work. Uh -huh. So it's possible, but but I think the normal, the average child at this age would be a closed reduction, through gram closed reduction. And Simon? Well, I'd first of all agree with uh, Jose and do a prolateral view. I'd want to confirm that the hips were reducing. If the hips were reducing, I'd probably use a harness. Um, sometimes it's a child very big in terms of the height of the harness in the age group, in which case I'd use a reduction. On the other hand, 
hips are reducing well in me in, 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 then I'll take the just well, I wanted to um, this again, the measurements there, but um, this was published in Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics is the IHDI classification with uh, grade one being normal, two mildly uh, dysplastic, three more dysplastic and four uh, very dislocated. And this is not too different. Uh, and this, this child on the right hip on the AP film is an IHDI grade three and an IHDI grade two on the on the opposite hip. Um, now it's not too dissimilar from the tonus classification, which a lot of the literature is based on, except that we can use ours without the ossification center, whereas tonus requires the ossification center and the relationship of the ossification center to the lateral edge of the acetabulum. So the tonus two is a little more severe but basically, we have mild, moderate, and severe, and it's been shown from Texas that this is a the IHCI classification is very reliable, reproducible, and has clinical validity. But uh, we need more more papers. Um, the reason I showed the tonus as well is that there's a paper um, published in International Orthopedics, which actually looked at treating children aged six to twelve months with the Pavlet, and um, they had an 81% success rate in the tonus type two and 25% tonus type three. So they didn't try any of the fours. And they said it may take longer to reduce. So since ours are IHDI twos and threes, one was a two, one was a three, there's some chance of success with a Pavlik. And um, and I think it may be worthwhile to try a Pavlik or as, as they've said, is to get an abduction film, see if it reduces and then make a decision. Here's the child in a pavlik harness um, and an ultrasound showing after eight weeks in the harness that the alpha angles have improved considerably to 63 and 67. Uh, the transverse views look pretty good. And um, this child was treated as if it were in a cast. So as the pavlik harness three months full time and then an Atlanta brace after that except for baths. And um, I don't know whether this is um, good or bad treatment, but was treated for seven months full time and then nighttime with Atlanta brace. So it was kind of treated like a, a cast case. And here's at 16 months and 20 months. And um, it's improving 30 months. It's not, uh, it's not completely normal at 30 months, but it's, it's better. Uh, this is where it is on the on the right, the child's right hip. Um, let's have some final comments, and then we'll call it a quits for the night. Um, is there a, a path? Scott, maybe you, since you said you will treat a child who's seven months old, do you have limits on who, who you'll treat? Oh, uh, one one year. One year. Up to one year. Up to one year. Up to one year. As long as they don't walk, but as long more, as walk. but more of the subluxated hips, not a dislocated hip, right? Threes, threes. Okay, Jim Casser, you've already kind of said what you would do. One quick summary. Yeah, the same. I mean, I think you can expand the the use of a padlock from the four to eight month old uh, in the the to the type two hip. The dysplastic, sure. the dysplastic hip. Any any final comments from our other panelists? I'll I think bracing is fine for dysplasia, but I think that dislocated hips, you have to reduce that because your outcomes aren't going to be as good as the pavlik harness. I would agree. And so um, I think a couple of the take-home messages from tonight as we wrap it up are, one, uh, the ultrasound can certainly guide treatment. The transverse view is easy to do. And if you can learn to do it in your clinic, you can really follow the instability with it a lot, a lot easier in the harness. Um, it is, it is a valuable and useful contribution. We tend to look at the graph, but the transverse view can really show you the instability. It's a better look at the Barlow test. I think the second take-home message we tried to give is that everybody on this panel, at least, is getting a little more aggressive with treatment because uh, we want the children to end up with an S tablet index that's closer to the mean. So we're a little more inclined to treat. And the third take-home message is that 
even after six months, you might consider treating the dysplastic hip um, and the, the type twos and threes, at least to see how they do. Uh, and you might do arthrograms or abduction films or other things to help guide that. So I think we'll conclude and I hope you'll attend our next webinar where we'll treat, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, a little bit more about actual uh, treatment methods and treatment pitfalls and management.